My name's Phil Subin and I'm the Chief Executive of the Political Studies Association. Uh, just a few quick words of welcome from me before we get uh, started. So thanks to all of you for, for coming along uh, uh, this evening for yet another pro uh, uh, <coughs> a bit of a Brexit discussion. And as some of you know, this is part of a series of events that we hold with the British Library here. Um, so for those of you who've been to some of our previous events, the format tonight is going to be uh, a little bit different. Uh, we've got a much larger number of, of speakers and contributors rather than one person giving a, giving a talk. So a chance to hear a, a wide range of perspectives. And we'll try and make sure that, that, that everyone uh, has an opportunity to be involved and indeed there is going to be an interactive element to the, to the evening. Um, for those of you who, who aren't uh, aware of us, the Political Studies Association is uh, the leading professional association, learned society for for those who uh, study and teach uh, politics, um, mainly in the UK, but not exclusively so. We do have international membership. But we want to increase that membership, not just in the academic community, but to reach out to undergraduate students, A-level students, and indeed the wider public. Um, and if you're interested in the organisation and potentially in joining, uh, we have some publications around uh, here this evening, uh, our newsletter, our Political Insight magazine, do please take away a copy of that and have a look at it. And we have brought some membership information with us. Um, so please either go to our website if you are interested in finding out more about the PSA or talk to me or one of my colleagues from the PSA staff uh, at the end of the evening. Uh, and a quick uh, trailer for the next event that we have jointly with the British Library here, which is on the 24th of June, which is going to be a discussion event on the future of conservatism, another highly topical issue. Um, just a few quick housekeeping points. As you may have noticed, we are filming uh, tonight's event, uh, and the video will be available on our website uh, later this week, I hope, and we are taking photographs uh, as well. Um, we aim to finish by half past eight. Um, I dare say if the discussion and debate is as uh, uh, entertaining as I expect it to be, uh, that might be a bit of a push, but we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, and the other thing I just want to mention before we start is that uh, we do have some, some broad guidelines relating to um, good conduct and free speech at, our, at, at all of our events. And I just want to sort of remind you of the key elements of that before we get going, which is simply, and I'm sure there will not be an issue here, but to ask you all to respect the, the following expectations. Firstly, of course, that you don't interrupt or heckle speakers either from the floor or indeed contributors from the audience. Um, that you respect the authority of the chair, who will try and allow as many people to participate as possible, uh, and uh, please no sort of audio or visual recording of the event, although obviously you can take pictures on your phone or uh, send tweets. So uh, thank you for that, and now without more ado, I'll hand over to the chair for the evening. I'd like to thank him in advance for uh, all the work he's already put into planning this. I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic success, uh, Don, Dr Andy Mycock. Thank you. I'm very uh, reassured by your faith in me, Phil. Uh, I often am described as a Betamax man in a VHS world, which is a joke that hits the age of about 50 and above and no one else. Um, and with that kind of technological challenge ahead, um, I'd first like to draw your attention to uh, we're trying a little bit of online voting tonight, just to try and get you to feel a little bit part of it. We have a, a very interesting uh, line of speakers. Uh, we are going to have a certain amount of turnover of those speakers, and we want to make sure that um, they all get their voice heard tonight, but also that you get your voices heard. This is not going to be an evening that uh, is going to be discussing the Malt House Compromise or MV3 or whatever machinations have been taking place in that esteemed uh, place by the river. I think we're all Brexited out in terms of that and whatever will be, will be. Tonight is really about trying to understand and to get a sense about how young people feel about Brexit and also how they see the future of this country after whatever is decided is decided. And in that sense, we really don't want to have a rerun of the debates of the last two and a half years. This is not a night for leavers and remainers. This is a night to think about young people. I'm really enthused that we've got such a 
cross-section of ages and backgrounds in this audience tonight. There is going to be a sense in which this is going to take the position, and as a 51-year-old white middle-aged man, I'm the perfect person to adopt this position, of young people looking at Brexit in terms of its generational implications. There are going to be some questions which originate from a project that myself and my colleague from the University of Huddersfield, Tom Logren, who sat down here, are looking at that, which we've been undertaking focus groups, talking to under 18s about lowering the voting age. And one of the issues has come up has been this sense of grievance about older citizens. So you might find that some of the questions kind of tease at some of these issues. Please do take part in the voting, though. Apparently, if you type that into your mobile device, and it will ask you for the PIN number, then that will then allow me to prompt you through the magic of technology to take part in some questions this evening. The way we're going to work this evening is that there's going to be three sections to it. They're briefly themed around three different issues. We've got eight wonderful speakers. Rather than introduce them all at once, I'm going to introduce them individually as they come up in different sections. So for this first section, we're going to be looking at what is the impact of Brexit on the life chance of young people in the future. And I'd like to introduce first Alexandra Burt. Alexander, please come to the stage. Alexander is the Political Studies Association Early Careers Network Communication Officer and also is a member of the Young Europeans um, Chair of the Three... Mi is it the Three Million? Yes. Terrible, you can't read when you've got your glasses on. I've hit that point of life where you either have them on or you have them off. I'm going to take them off. Second is Jake Cooper, who's made a trip from the Midlands. Uh, he's the counsel for Belle Vale uh, Ward in Dudley and Burr, and he's brought some of his friends along. So I hear a little bit of a cheer from them, possibly. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. More cheering aloud, by the way. We'd like a bit of atmosphere in the room. Uh, thirdly is the president of the National Union of Students, Sakira Martin. Um, who I wonderfully met at the Any Questions broadcast in Manchester. She's a, a wonderful speaker. And fourthly is Lara Spirit, who is the co-president of Our Future, Our Choice, which is a, um, a group um, campaigning around issues around Brexit and the referendum, and possibly the chance of a second referendum, if I'm correct or rightly. If you've all managed to load your phones up, is that, is it, are we sort of there? Is anyone, most people there? Before we start with our panel, I'd like to start with a question. This is where the whole night either goes right or it goes wrong. So if this doesn't, nothing happens, then it goes wrong. If you want to tweet, apparently Twitter is a thing. I'm not sure it's a good thing, but it's a thing. Uh, Brexit youth, if you have any opinions about my poor quality jokes or uh, the evening and the debate, or you want any opinions, you want to get your voice, we are collecting these. And we are, at the end of this event, going to bring together the thoughts of you, the audience, and of our panellists, and we're going to write something up to put in the public remit. We think that this event should have a legacy in a way. But this is the first question. Who do you think is primarily responsible for the current Brexit? And we were thinking about the word. The word could be many words, but we thought uncertainties was a, a way in which we could prefer to express a sense that whether you were a leave or a remain voter, there's a sense of uncertainty in the country. Apparently, you have about nine, 60 seconds to vote. Has it come up on your phones? Oh, I press start. There you go. You see, I've learned something. There you go. This is perfectly rehearsed, as you can see. I want our, audience, our panelists to think about this, because I'm going to ask you, who do you think is primarily responsible for our Brexit uncertainties? I'm going to start with Jake. Who do you think? The microphones are there in front of you, if you please help yourself. Who do you think? Don't think about what they're going to say. Think about who do you think? Who do you think is primarily responsible for the Brexit uncertainties? Uh, personally, for me, um, <clears throat> as being someone who uh, avidly supports uh, the, the government's current deal, um, the one thing that I, I, I believe is that it's, it's down to the MPs that voted down that deal uh, that, that we saw last week, because for me, I thought that that was the... The, the best way that we could deliver the referendum results, uh, become a, a global Britain, and also maintain quite strong uh, relationship with the European Union. Wow, there you go. <laughs> Nearly 50% of our audience, or 40% say that it's David Cameron. Interestingly, over a quarter agree with you, Jake, that it is the Westminster elites. Shakira, where would you sound that? So, I would say 
I'm going to give a different kind of answer. I would say all, apart from Remainers, not only because I'm a Remainer, but I think they're all interlinked. I think David Cameron, when he called for the referendum, didn't know what he was actually doing and the mess that he would get us in. But he is part of the Westminster elite anyway, and I think that's just the way our society breeds the same type of people. Um, Theresa May... Her, You're not allowed to go down the whole no? list. The okay, so I think it's all interlinked, but I think David Cameron definitely... Um, because he didn't know what he was calling for. what did you think? I actually would agree with, with Shakira here, but I don't think it's David Cameron as a politician himself. I actually quite liked David Cameron when he was, he was Prime Minister compared to Theresa May today, but I think it's the way the Remain campaign was run and how he expected that he would win the campaign and therefore had very little planning because he expected to, to win the campaign. So I think it's a mixture as well, but David Cameron, not as a person, as a politician, but his lack of planning behind all the Remain campaign that he uh, and others led. Yeah, I think as a Remainer, I'd probably have to agree. And I would say this week, you've seen a lot of the anger at David Cameron resurface because there's all this sort of uncertainties happening. You've seen pictures of his shed sort of shared around Twitter and him sitting gleefully there. But I think the Westminster elites is quite a good one because it incorporates kind of all of the politicians. And I do think that there is an incredible amount of anger and disaffection that people feel, uh, not just towards Theresa May and her cabinet, who I think are primarily responsible because they failed to converge around a Brexit option. They failed to define what they actually thought Brexit would mean. And they failed really to ever face up to the difficult decisions that would have to come with Brexit. You know, are you going to choose sovereignty or are you going to choose trade? And for me, those, you know, those decisions were never really made until far too late. Uh, but I do think that in the last couple of weeks especially, MPs failing to come around uh, a consensus or even failing to sort of reach out across the House um, and to really, I think, show some responsibility about the fact that our nation is in crisis. I would say that I am going to have to go with the Westminster elites. But David Cameron's one of them too, so I guess. That was a deliberate act, by the way. It was like a sort of cathartic release. <laughs> We've done Brexit. We've done the bit that's possibly going to divide the audience about leavers and remains. It was a deliberate tool just to get you to sort of think about it. What I'm really interested in in this debate is, is more the idea about where do we go next and what are the implications of Brexit for young people today? And I think that this is something which helps us. And in that sense, Shakira, what do you think to that main question? What do you think is going to be the implications, the impact? I think there's going to be many impacts. I think the fact that young people's future is being stripped away from them at, at so easily. But from an education fund, I think the uncertainty around the Erasmus programme, the European Social Fund, and the, um, the beauty of having academics across Europe coming to live, work, um, and study, and students studying in our, in our, in our country, I think that... You know, social mobility, when we talk about social mobility, um, a lot of students benefit from being able to learn from our European brothers and sisters. And we know that education transforms and changes lives. And I think it's really dangerous in what it's doing for many young people, especially the working classes um, around, around the future of young people and, and the uncertainty. Thanks. Jay. I'm quite optimistic, actually, uh, with Brexit itself. I mean, uh, if we can get a, a good, strong uh, a deal, such as uh, the one that's been put forward by the government, uh, I believe that we can uh, become a global Britain that will provide opportunities uh, for young people um, for our country and across the globe. I mean, uh, in regards to university, um, uh, there's a, a lot of uncertainty around, uh, you know, funding, but I mean... Uh, to be honest, the, the government has put, uh, said that they're putting in £7 billion, uh, over five years to uh, 2022, uh, which is the, the largest increase uh, over 40 years. And that, for me, kind of secures the side for uh, research and development. And, of course, they've also said that um, current students taking degrees from European countries uh, can complete their course and continue to study in the United Kingdom. I mean, Forbes has, has ranked the UK the best country for two years in a row now for business and um, PwC has said that the UK could be the fastest growing economy in the G7 uh, between now and 2050 and for me that kind of um, opens a, a new avenue for Britain to become a, a new economic um, and uh, political power in the world, uh, trading freely with other countries. And uh, that in itself brings opportunities for young people because yeah. with a strong, independent, free trade deals, uh, businesses within those countries um, will be more favourable to working with the UK and also open up those opportunities for young people. Oh. 
Please feel as though you want to get involved. They, they applaud these a lot. Do you share that optimism, Laura? Um, I don't respectfully share that optimism. Um, I think that Brexit is nothing short of a disaster for young people. Uh, I think the current Brexit deal that we've got on offer is especially disastrous. Uh, it's so far away from what we were promised as a country two years ago. We're, you know, Brexit's costing us already £500 million a week. We were promised more trade, and yet Liam Fox is failing to even roll over our existing <coughs> trade agreements with other, the other European countries have. Um, we know that, I think, in my opinion, this deal falls so far short of our current deal within the European Union. Um, and crucially for me, uh, Brexit and this deal especially offers us no clarity or closure about what our future relationship with the European Union is going to look like. So we've got a big, chunky withdrawal agreement uh, and a very, very thin political declaration, uh, which gives us very, very little idea uh, about the destination where we're going to end up. But we're being asked as young people, as the generation who are going to have to deal with this consequence for the longest to take that monumental leap with absolutely no idea what the consequences for us will be. Uh, I work for a youth campaign called Our Future, Our Choice. We're part of the People's Vote campaign. We want a People's Vote slash second referendum. Uh, and we did a report in October uh, which looked into, we did it with uh, academics at Oxford University and the LSE, and it looked into what could the economic consequences of Brexit be for young people. And Sir John Major wrote the foreword for that. And it found that under a no-deal Brexit, something which we've been told is ruled out, but obviously is not and cannot be categorically ruled out until we've decided on an alternative, that young people could lose up to £108,000 in lost earnings by 2050. Uh, and the current Brexit deal, and these, this, is, this is using, by the way, um, you know, cross-Whitehall analysis, so the government's own uh, economic uh, information to make these decisions. Um, under the current deal, you're looking at a £76,000 uh, loss in earnings by 2050 uh, for young people. So this is something, and you know, we've spoken about freedom of movement and the poll that People's Vote did at this uh, did this weekend found that young people uh, are in favour of freedom of movement by 22 to 1. You know, the, the freedom to live, work and, and love abroad is something which young people feel very, very strongly about. Um, but I do think that, personally, mm. Brexit is going to be a disaster for young people. And I think part of the reason with that clarity and closure is that... Uh, all of the energy and ingenuity and talent of our generation is going to have to be not focusing on things like climate change, which so many of us care so strongly about, but it is going to be focusing on something which the overwhelming majority of us voted against and which the overwhelming majority of us think uh, makes no sense for our country. And so for that reason, I think that we have reason to be very angry uh, and pessimistic about our futures under Brexit. And I'm sorry about that, but that's the way it is. But I still think a people's vote is a possibility and it could all be stopped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of the evidence would suggest, by the way, that although the economic implications may be significant for a lot of people, particularly those who don't go to university, particularly those not in the knowledge economy, who are on zero-hours contracts or in very fragile environments, this is a conversation that has no relevance to them. Because if you're starting at that position, that maybe it isn't. I don't know whether you want to come in on that, Alexandra, and sort of come back on that. Well, I had quite a different perspective on, on this because I can't actually officially say I'm a Leave or a Remainer because I actually couldn't vote in the referendum. And it's, I find it quite difficult to say because I didn't actually cast a vote because as a non-UK EU citizen, even if I've been living in the UK for over six years now, I couldn't express my, my view officially on this, this debate. And I wanted just to say that there are over three million EU citizens in the UK and over a million British people in other EU member states who actually have been, most of them, in limbo over a thousand days almost. So it's on Wednesday, it's a thousand days since the referendum. And I know you'll say, well, the government has agreed on the settlement scheme, for example, but believe me, every day because I work in outreach, I meet including young people who have no idea what will happen with their rights and we still need to inform them and tell them that they will need to apply to stay in their own homes after Brexit, basically. And I would say this is relevant for young people because the majority of uh, EU citizens migrate to the UK when they're under 30 years old. And also unlike the stereotype of the British pens uh, pensioners in Costa del Sol or Benidorm, actually most British people abroad are in work, over two thirds, and many of them actually migrate when they are uh, young as well, when they're in, in their 20s or their 30s. And my personal perspective to this, which I, I agree, um, I agree with some of the panelists on this, that freedom of movement actually enabled me as, as a Romanian citizen to come here when I was 18 to study 
And it wouldn't have been possible without having the same conditions as British people in terms of the fees and the access to the loan system. And I would think, if I look amongst my friends, Romanian and mainly Eastern European friends, none of my friends could have afforded to come here with the current non-EU student fees and without an access to the loan system or alternatively EU-funded scholarships by different, different governments. So I would say, I can't be officially on one side or another because I didn't vote and I generally don't see an impact in that sense for like more privileged rich people because they'll be able to study abroad still their family will pay for their studies but for people like me and people who, like my even my British friends who study now in Bucharest some of them they couldn't meet they probably wouldn't meet those income thresholds that they are currently proposed for migration post Brexit and probably couldn't afford mm. to pay for for their studies so I would say there's an impact on the personal level for me for my friends but also an impact on universities and on employers and all the different institutions that deal with young people in, in this country and, and the other EU countries as well. I just want to move on and, and think about it in some senses, about this sense about how Brexit makes us feel. It's a very interesting question itself, that when you go beyond the arguments for or against or whatever the future might seem, there is a sense in which there's an emotional feeling towards Brexit, that it makes us feel a certain way. And to go back to the technology, if it works, I'd just like to bring our audience back in again and ask them, how does Brexit make you feel? Proud? Optimistic? Ashamed? Pessimistic? Bored, possibly? Is it over yet? Or just anxious? Again, Jake, does Brexit make you, you said you felt made optimistic? Can you understand how the fellow people on this panel feel more pessimistic? I mean, the one thing for me, I mean, uh, obviously at the moment, as said, there's a lot of uh, scepticism and there's a lot of people being left in, in limbo at the moment. But I mean, at the moment, um, uh, there's been a, a deal put forward that ensures... That's right. Can you understand how they feel, though? I want you just to get that sense of empathy. Do you understand why the three people around you feel quite so anxious? I mean, I, I can definitely understand, you know, the, the, the feelings of uh, the, the other panellists. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a new step for the UK moving forward. And, of course, there's going to be uh, some times where we're going to say, you know, uh, there's going to be obstacles. But it's about moving past that and being optimistic. And as I said earlier, uh, for me, it's about ensuring that we can overcome those obstacles. And, uh, as I mean, for me, uh, yeah. the UK at the moment uh, has got a really strong position when it comes okay. to the economy. Before you, so. before you go off and repeat re what you've said, do you understand this optimism that, 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 that Jake has here, this sense that the future may well be um, positive? I mean, for me, it's about a class thing. I think those in privilege, the privileged few, regardless if we leave or remain, they will be okay. For me, as a mother with two young black, young children growing up, I am scared for the future of my children. I'm scared and ashamed that we are almost showing that we don't want, uh, we can't see um, past our own backyard. Um, it makes me feel angry, it makes me feel sad, and if I didn't have children, I would definitely be thinking about whether I would want to bring them into this world under this current circumstances. Hands up, who put their hands up and said they were bored by Brexit? Who was bored? Who put their hands up and said <laughs> bored by Brexit? Can I borrow one of these microphones? Why do you think, why are you bored? Well, but that maybe is a, a reaction, kind of uh, opinion, because in the beginning, uh, I think uh, the way I saw Brexit was like going through the stages of uh, grief. You know, in the beginning, you are angry, and then you don't know if it is happening, and then you want to bargain. And now, precisely because it is uncertainty, is never ending, so you are really <laughs> lost in transition, you get a bit bored, but of course, it's provocative. They Thank call you. it Brexit and brand is Brexit. Everything's got Brex on it, indeed. But that's it. If you look around there, there's a, there's a sizable sense within the audience that there is a pessimism about this. He says, "Some of you said ashamed, ashamed. Hands up, you said ashamed." Alistair, I should go to you, but I can't because I feel like I'll be favouring someone I know. Why are you ashamed, sir? Have we got the microphone? Well, um, you know. I, I, I'm 70, and uh, you know, you're a spring chicken compared with me. I mean, I just, Speak like, on, I, sweet I, lips I, that never told a lie. 
<laughs> I, I suppose I, mean, I, feel, I feel for the country, really. And, you know, I have friends in France, I have friends in Germany, and um, they, they just can't understand what we're doing. Um, the Speaker is now the, most be the best known politician in Europe, apparently, and the Germans make uh, YouTube clips of him saying order. Um, <laughs> You know, well, where does this leave us as, 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 a, as a nation? I mean, I'm, I, I grew up with some kind of respect for Britain, despite all the traumas that I've lived through. And now uh, it's just such a mess, such a mess. Thank you. Uh, I, yeah. What more can I say? Well, not that much more needs to be said. In a way, I think what this says behind us, and it's interesting that I assume that some of our pride and optimism is on about row four, Hello, gentlemen. Our friends have come down from Diddley, and they are indeed expressing that. Did anyone else say pride? Did anyone else in the audience say pride, or am I accurate in identifying where our source of pride and optimism? <laughs> Sorry? It's on. Yes, you're there. Yes. This, the whole Brexit campaign was based on um, immigration. And I think that whole issue um, and the outcome of the referendum has made everyone feel as though we are all racist, nationalistic, xenophobic. In London, for example, if you look at who actually runs out, drives our tube um, trains, and they change themselves, and who drives the buses, it's all people of colour. Who, um, with regard to the hospitals here in London, if you go into any of the major hospitals um, and look around, many of the doctors are from an Asian origin. And, or and the point is that this makes and you feel ashamed. It, it yes. makes you feel ashamed, because we're, we're, <laughs> this whole um, campaign has been based on immigration. It makes... Everyone, and so we're tarred with the same brush, and we are not. Thank you very much for your contribution. What I want to think about, just to finish off this section, is in some ways, if we have this divergence, and I can assure you where I work in um, the north of England, in a place called Huddersfield, if I did this event, I bet I could flip that. I seriously bet I could flip it. So it's interesting to be in London to have an audience where you see it in this context. I have done public events across the north of England. There needs to be some form of healing taking place. This seems to show a sense of trauma in society that we can't seem to. You sounded yourself, madam, really quite anxious about the impact of this. Laura, how do you think young people can help in bringing some sense of healing of the divisions in, in society. Yeah, I think it would maybe be slightly more useful to talk about this in a couple of weeks or months where we know what's going to happen with Brexit. At the moment, I think uh, it's a lot to ask young people who are going to lose out so much on Brexit uh, to contribute to a process of healing of something that, in my opinion, is not yet a done deal. Uh, there's still very much a chance, I think, that we could have a people's vote on this. I think the worst thing for divisions on in this country, and I think we have to accept that we are a very divided country, uh, and that Brexit, I think, brought a lot of those divisions uh, to the forefront of, of our national debate in politics. But my personal feeling with this is that like, the, the worst way to deal with divisions is to ram through a deal the third or fourth time after Parliament has rejected it repeatedly and for very good reasons uh, without putting it to the public, without a fresh and renewed mandate on that deal. Um, I, think, I think ramming through a deal which makes us poorer and which I don't think anybody voted for is no way to start a healing process with the country. Uh, and I think it's very difficult to talk about this when we are in the absolute midst of, of the crisis. And, and I think in the next couple of weeks we'll have some, maybe slightly some more resolve on, on what's going to happen. But at the moment it's very difficult to say, I'm sorry, how we can contribute to that. No, it's okay. A bit too much. Awesome. Very briefly, Alexandra. Well, I, 
As a citizens' rights campaigner, I find it quite amazing we still have no definite answer on citizens' rights, which is an issue both leavers and remainers agree on. There's cross-party support. So for months we've been campaigning to ring-fence the deal on EU citizens in the UK and British citizens abroad, regardless of the Brexit outcome, and we still don't have that. Although recently Theresa May has written to, to the EU about this, so there's some positive, <laughs> there's some hope there. And one way to heal divisions is actually to allow young people to have more of a voice to actually express their views in politics. And as someone who's not British, who's a young European but not British, I feel we didn't really have a voice. First of all, we couldn't vote. But even then, like we didn't really have a voice in the media or in debates on, on this issue. And this does affect us directly in the same way as my British friends in other EU countries. So I feel we should have more of a voice and in, in, in this debate. Exactly. To even start a conversation, we need to have a voice first to be able to have any consensus on those issues. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, um, if, if I could, I mean, in, in the area where I'm from, uh, a lot of young people, as, as you can see with, with uh, uh, some of the people that have come down with me today, a lot of young people in, in working class areas such as where I'm from in Dudley uh, and in areas of the West Midlands and uh, even further places up north as well, um, a lot of young people actually came out to support um, leave in the EU referendum. And, it, and I would like to say it wasn't to do with immigration, um, primarily it, for young people when speaking to them, not only on the streets and also in, in um, uh, various youth forums, it was about ensuring that we can work globally across the world and secure opportunities for those young people uh, in the future. I mean, we've seen with CAMSA, ERZAC, um, with Canada, New Zealand and Australia, creating a, a close relationship with those countries. And that's proving to, uh, looking to provide some brilliant opportunities. And I mean, at the moment, like I said earlier, uh, Britain has got a brilliant place in the world. And I mean, young people, um, in, in areas such as mine can see that and are optimistic about what Brexit can offer. So, I mean, when saying that Brexit is, is, is all about being seen as, as racist almost, it, it kind, of, um, uh, kind of goes against what some of the young people have told me from my area. And I mean, to get young pe more young people involved and help the healing, I think it's about kind of bringing these different groups of young people together because we've had the votes, it's, it's gone through, we're going to be leaving the European Union and it's about getting young people together to say, look, how can we make Britain uh, one of the strongest countries in the world globally for opportunities for young people and it's about getting their voice in that. Although I would like to alert you to a uh, groundbreaking book coming out in Oxford University Press later this year on the Anglosphere, which might disagree with some of what you're saying. Shakir, <laughs> never, never miss an opportunity to promote myself. Um, Shakir. I Hi. think the pain that we're feeling at the moment as young people and the divide is nothing to what it will be if we leave the European Union. For me, it's about going to the corners of society that don't have these platforms to get their voices heard. It's about young people. We know that they are doing better than politicians in leading the way. The climate change um, demonstration was just a little example of young people no longer being apathetic, but ready to take the lead and um, push the, um, the country in the direction that we want. But for me, it's about getting more young people involved in politics. When you look at politics, it looks like a middle class, straight white man, middle class, boring, unengaging, unrelatable subject when actually it's the working classes, those in marginalised communities like where I'm from in Peckham, Broccoli and Lewisham. And I do understand and I do respect that, you know, life up north and life in big towns um, like London is very different um, and people's experiences are different. But for me, until we get different types of people coming through the education system, moving into politics, will we get the change? And for me, this is why Votes at 16 is just the touch of the iceberg. It's about being truly representative and breaking down those barriers some people having to step back so marginalised voices can be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think one of the things that's come out in the, in the conversations around Brexit is the extent to which, over the past couple of years, it's highlighted a sense in which maybe many of us didn't quite understand how the European Union worked, what its implications were in our daily lives, and also the Brexit process itself, to what extent um, Brexit itself has been a process that we have had a real comprehension of. And in this second section, I want to think about this idea about to what extent do young people understand Brexit itself and do they understand it? Uh, we're joined 
uh, now by uh, Esther Follis from Northern Ireland. She's from the Wallace High School in Lisbon. She won the Political Studies Association video conference looking at Brexit, what does it mean to you? Uh, Kira Luce, who's a trustee of the wonderful British Youth Council. Uh, Jack Norquay is a member for Orkney in the Scottish Youth Parliament. And Dr James Weinberg, who's a member of the PSA Young People's Politics Group and is uh, a leading researcher on uh, citizenship education in uh, the UK. Again, I'd like to bring you in as the audience if possible. I don't know if this will work. And very simply, and it's wonderful that we've got such a varied age, is those of you who are young will be able to answer this from your own perspective. Many of you are of slightly older, may have young people in your lives who you may think about in this sense. But to what extent do you think young people understand Brexit? 60 seconds. And while we're mulling that over, Jack, thinking about it from the Scottish perspective, do you think that the young people that you know, your friends that are politically active, and more importantly, those that maybe aren't so active, do they understand what's been happening with Brexit? Well, hello there. Um, I think I might flip that question on its head, and let's just strike out the word young for a moment. Do people understand Brexit? Beautiful. And I don't think they do. And I'll speak from a Scottish perspective. You know that in 2014, we held a referendum in Scotland. And it might frighten you, but that referendum campaign was actually two years long. So you might have hated the Brexit uh, campaign. That was only a couple of months, but actually it was a benefit that it was longer. And in Scotland, what we witnessed was a debate that, yes, was heated at times, but was fact-based and was a meaningful, constructive debate about our future. And what it's resulted in is this, this hotbed of political activity in Scotland in really, really positive terms. And that's because we had such a good debate in Scotland. When you look at the EU referendum in 2016, what an absolutely disgraceful campaign that was in many aspects. Um, and we can see that there. But yes, and in terms of young people, I think the legacy from 2014 in Scotland is that they were so engaged by that constructive uh, debate that they understood, but when with Brexit, because it was perhaps not such a constructive uh, debate in the campaign period, has resulted in disengagement from the rest of the process. Esther, you made a film. You talk to young people about Brexit in Northern Ireland. Obviously, we think about it now that during the referendum, Northern Ireland was almost absent in the debate about it. No one really thought about the implications, except for a few people who wrote pithy articles that no one read. <laughs> I'm good at this. Uh, what do you think? What do you think when you talk to young people in Northern Ireland? Do they get a sense of it? Do you um, think that the backstops give them that learning? I'm actually quite surprised at the results. Um, of that vote, because I would say from talking to friends um, and talking to young people in Belfast and Northern Ireland, it was a, a very strong no. Um, and follow up on what Jack said, did people in general understand um, what, what implications Brexit would have in Northern Ireland? I mean, like when I was thinking about it the other day um, and what I was going to say tonight, throughout the whole the past couple of months, all I've heard is backstop, backstop, hard border, soft border, no border, stop back. But like at any point during the Brexit campaign, did that come up at all? No. And yes, don't get me wrong, it is very easy to forget Northern Ireland, and we can be quite irrelevant at, at some points. But um, the hard the border is something that is close to my heart, um, and something that is going to have a big implication um, on my future, um, and a lot of people's future in Northern Ireland, a lot of young people's future. Um, and I do not think at all people understood that at the time of the vote. Yeah. Here are the same. You, you're obviously being uh, a member of the British Youth Council, you know, the largest youth organisation, highly politically engaged in people. If anyone's going to understand this process, it would be them. Do you get that sense that your members understand Brexit? Um, well, I think our membership is pretty representative of all young people in the country. Just to set a bit of background, uh, I joined the BYC when I was 14, so that means I was 16 at the time of the referendum. Obviously couldn't vote, and I'll turn 18 all the way through this long process. Um, I think the way that our membership uh, have always been thinking during that is actually we haven't been spoken to, we haven't been listened to about it. We certainly haven't been heard on any means. 
Um, and so I think that any kind of discussion around Brexit hasn't been young people's focus. We haven't had our issues listened to. We heard just now a lot of the issues that are arising around education and housing and actually the fact that it disproportionately affects working class young people. And actually the voices in the British Youth Council, we've been trying, we've been going to APPGs and saying, you know, this is what our case for put forward. This is what we could look like in a post-Brexit Britain. And actually it's been quite clear that the government just haven't been listening to us. And therefore I think any sort of conversation around Brexit it, it, it's, it's, it's a two-way uh, conversation, um, it just hasn't happened. So the government haven't understood uh, young people's concerns around Brexit, and young people just don't understand the, gen the general Brexit sphere, because frankly, how's it worked um, in our favour? Because we haven't been involved in it, no one's really reached out and gone, well, what do you really think? So no, I don't think we really do understand it, but I think we understand the impact it's going to have. We understand that actually a lot's at stake here, we understand that it's going to have a detrimental impact on the issues that we particularly that we care about, but ultimately, are we going to sit down and read the withdrawal agreement or 600 odd pages of it? No, we have our own priorities, but we understand the impact that it's having. And actually, the fact that we, we're now having to inherit a severely divided country, and that is something that we should all be concerned about. And you don't understand, that many young people probably don't understand, but they're very aware of the implications of that in some ways. It's interesting, James, because you know, your research has been looking at citizen education about how young people are socialised into democratic activism and participation. And all three of our speakers have come up with a very similar theme in some ways, which matches your response, which is not particularly great reading when we think about the situation we're in. Why? Why do you think there is this issue? Well, I think, firstly, this question is obviously and evidently provocative, as I would expect. Absolutely. Nothing less from Andy. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there are a number of responses. I think, you know, on, on one hand, UK citizens do have notoriously low levels of political knowledge, and academics have shown this is actually quite pronounced amongst young people. Mm. On the other hand, the decision to leave the EU was a rejection of not only what the vast majority of young people voted for, but also what the vast majority of supposedly highly knowledgeable political and business elites said was in the best interest for this country. And in that sense, young people were on the side of those who supposedly knew the most. But we also shouldn't confuse, and I think this comes across in this debate, knowledge with interest. I think back in 2016, the EU was still rather an abstract and remote issue for young people. You know, it was far less important than issue-based and pressing economic concerns like jobs, healthcare, and housing. The, the statistics don't lie. Young people have borne the brunt of austerity, and they will continue to do so. And in 2016, those were the issues dominating uh, young people's politics. But as soon as the referendum campaign gathered pace, and most significantly since the negotiations have begun, young people have become hyper-engaged in an issue that is clearly going to affect their lives far more than those who voted, or well, most of those who voted for or against it. Um, a poll last year, a YouGov poll last year, showed that 88% of young people surveyed, I think the sample was about 10,000, said that they were following Brexit very closely. And that was more than any other um, age group in the, in the survey. So young people are engaged. But I would go back to what Jack said, and I would suggest that this question is rephrased again to say, does anyone of any age group fully understand or understood in 2016 what Brexit means or continues to mean? Um, you know, the EU is, a, even for those of us who study it, is a behemoth of administrative, legal, and political networks and institutions. And in my opinion, it was a failure of representative democracy in this country that a simple yes-no vote on UK membership was ever offered to the general population. Um, you couple that with the parlous state of dog whistle politics that we saw during the campaign and a lack of fundamental political education in schools and lifelong political participatory, uh, participatory mechanisms for people in wider society. And what you have is a toxic mix of febrile politics um, and ultimately people making emotional pleas uh, and voting emotionally and now dealing with the repercussions. Very good. Thank you, Jed. Thank you very much indeed. Anyway, Laura, this brings back to you because your campaign came to my university campus. And um, to say that there was a, uh, a lack of uh, interest was that even my own politics students didn't know you were on coming to the campus because they didn't follow you on Twitter, it wasn't announced, and I think you turned up and about um, 50 people turned up. Whereas I was in the centre of Manchester on Friday 
and saw hundreds and hundreds of young people camping against climate change. And this is no criticism of your organisation, I'm interested in you. There seems to be something here about young people, if they do support, and maybe some young people, obviously young people, all young people do support this idea of a second referendum or a remain, young people haven't been able to sway public opinion on the issue of Brexit in the way that they have done in a sh short few weeks about climate change. You know, one young girl has managed to spread it into a global campaign in a way. Is there something here about this that's in that? I'm interested. Um, I'm wary of that. I think it's what Kira was saying as well about young people haven't been given a voice. And that's something which is really mm. important, is that when we started this campaign, uh, we were only ever put on media or anything when it was to talk specifically about youth issues. You know, we were never considered... Uh, even, you know, it was never even possible, this idea that young people could engage in the same way on this issue uh, than their elders. When actually, you know, we do events on campuses, as you said, but we also do uh, at least two or three events in schools every week. So we've now done about over 200 and some people from my old school are actually here tonight, which is great. And um, we did an event with them and we asked the local MP to come and speak to, the, uh, to their young constituents. Uh, and often they, the school will say yes and the MP will say yes. Uh, and I am always pleasantly surprised with how much the young people know at these events. Always they know far more than the MP ever expects them to know. And what I always find an incredibly gratifying uh, experience is young people asking incredibly frank questions and incredibly knowledgeable questions to their MPs uh, who are not expecting it. They come to these events, they don't prepare usually, uh, and they are absolutely grilled by their young constituents who say to them, why aren't you standing up for my future? Uh, you know, I want, often, uh, you know, I want people to vote, but other often really technical questions that they just don't think young people are capable of. And I found I also that their responses have, have been showing in a lot of MPs a severe lack of knowledge for people who is actually, as we were saying, it's their job to understand stand Brexit you know it shouldn't be our job we have other things that we can say we don't we haven't stood for election you know we, we don't openly say that mm. we, we want to be a politician but these people are paid money to make these decisions for us and I think it was a huge dereliction of duty for that decision to be handed to us as it was uh, but since for them to have completely failed to work out what it is that Brexit means and to have reached a consensus and now we're all here talking about this uh, when it's completely their fault and I really really believe strongly uh, as you said yeah climate look climate change is a is a, an issue which has mobilised young people in their hundreds of thousands. And somebody like Greta Thunberg has been an incredibly unifying and inspiring figure. But I think the young people uh, are mobilising uh, against Brexit. I think if you're in London on Saturday at 12pm, you will see hundreds of thousands of them on the streets doing the exact same thing. Uh, and I do think they care very, very strongly. And I really believe that this generational divide uh, will not be healed uh, for a very, very long time should uh, politicians force through this deal without the consent of the people, is my... Just to take that on, because it's interesting, I've been trying to avoid the generational divide issue, but you mentioned that. Do you think there's a generational divide, Esther? Do you think that this has driven a wedge between younger and older citizens? Um, yes and no. I think depending on uh, different people and how different people view it. Um, for me, yes. Um, I know from personal experience, a lot of people that have come in um, to talk about Brexit in, po in our politics class um, in school. All the Remainers have been younger and, and all the Leavers have been old. And I think it's um, it's only fair, I think, and it's only democratic to get um, a fair representation of people across the board. And I think that just, like you said, just does create um, an ageist divide um, between older and younger people. Yeah. In Scotland, where, of course, 67% are people voted to remain, do you think that the age issue plays as similarly there, or do you think that it's less prominent? It, it definitely does uh, play a part. I, it, I know I, I was only I couldn't vote in the EU referendum. Um, the two weeks prior to the EU referendum, um, I was travelling across Europe on a school trip, and we came back on polling day. Um, and I know by the time I got back to Scotland, we I, the result had come through, and I came back very angry. Um, at some of my uh, relatives that had voted to leave. But once I kind of understood what had happened, I kind of changed my um, attitude towards that. Not as, hanger, not as anger, but where do we take this from now in terms of meaningfully engaging everyone 
in society. Um, and I think it's really dangerous when you pinpoint young people up against old people. Um, mm. And I think if we take a human rights based approach to this, I think that is a way that um, we can unite everyone around this. But yes, absolutely, there is a generational divide, but um, ways of uh, solving that, I think we'll come back to later in terms of votes at 16, but I'll leave that there. It's always nice when a panel's got the microphones twitching. <laughs> Save me from it. Kieran, then we'll come into James, yeah. Um, well, obviously this probably comes as a surprise based on the fact that I'm, I'm here to represent young people's council, but I don't blame young pe I don't blame old people for Brexit at all. I think there are some statistical divides, sure, but what I think fuels Brexit much more so than anything else, I come from a divided household myself, like my parents vote different ways, uh, is actually much more about our reflection on austerity and how this country in the past 10, 20, 30, more so years, have really given an attitude um, towards people in disenfranchised areas. Like my area of Somerset uh, has the worst level of social mobility for any young person in Britain. And I think that that's really telling uh, that actually our area was really split because actually um, there were pockets of, uh, pockets of privilege and pockets of areas where people don't progress to university, don't progress to college because we don't have the access to those opportunities. And I think that Brexit is reflected much more so in class divides. And actually, there are some things that you can say, well, this is all what old people voted for, what young people voted for. But ultimately, like in my area, we had young people leave, leading our Leave campaign. We had young people who couldn't vote campaigning day in, day out for Stronger In. And ultimately, if you walk down to Westminster now, you'll probably see maybe 50 people over the age of 60 both remain and leave who are out with EU flags or vote leave banners. And so actually, I think this is something that if we class it off as all our people vote to take our future away, um, actually, as a young person, I, I actually do feel quite angry, angry about that. But however, if we just put that down purely to all old people voted leave, then we're um, actually... Not, not, not allowing ourselves to have valuable conversations because then we're putting each other in different boxes and it just hasn't worked out that way. So, yeah, I mean, young people obviously do feel some kind of anger that we, people like me that couldn't vote, we have had our future taken away from us, but do I blame old people for that specifically? No, like they had a multitude of reasons to vote leave and it was completely valid, but yeah. We will be holding the post-event uh, soiree outside Parliament <laughs> later on if you want to join us, by the way. Yeah. James. Um, there's three three quick points I wanted to make. The first one was, okay, so this is this, this general narrative that we have, talking about the majority of statistics out there, that you're pitching older generations who have revived some sort of or nationalist sentiment about British sovereignty against younger post-material cohorts who care more about issues like the environment and cultural diversity. Now, at, at that, taking those broad kind of brush strokes um, as an approach, I think what, what this has the entire Brexit debate has been indicative of, more than anything that kind of worries me, is the fragile social fabric of the UK in the 21st century. And this is probably something that was, we should have seen coming many years before Brexit. If anything, it's just a catalyst or a lightning rod for, for those issues. And that's making us confront what I think is a very awkward and uncomfortable question, which is what does it mean to be British? And we as a nation have to do a lot of soul searching and figure out what the answer to that is. The second point is if you take a more refined approach, actually just over a third of young people who voted in the referendum voted leave. It would be our dereliction of our duty to pretend that young people are an entirely homogenous group. And it would also be wrong to assume that our young people will continue to have these open-minded or, as we might say, liberal, tolerant attitudes as they grow older. I mean, I, I've done research in more than 60 schools in the last two years, and there wasn't a single member of staff who couldn't tell me of uh, another teacher of, of black or uh, ethnic minority who had received increased abuse from pupils during the last two years. And the Anne Frank Trust in the UK reported that hate crimes and hate violence in schools had gone up 50% uh, in the year after Brexit. You know. Politics, in a sense, is our public, it's how we, we role play the societal values we care about most. And in a way, the divisive politics of Brexit, I fear, has trickled down and we need, we need to protect our young people as much as criticize any other cohort in the, in the population for what are hopefully non-British values. And I don't like using the word British in front of values, but that's what the educational establishment is doing at the moment. And the final point, I think, is to extrapolate from all this. 
I do believe that the that Brexit has demonstrated that our parliamentary system of politics is not fit for purpose in the 21st century. The levels of party defections we've seen we have not occurred at such a rate since the late 70s. The interminable stagnation in the parliamentary process is, is painful to watch and to study and research and to, to listen to. I mean, I'm sure we're all, you know, we're remarkably not being so Brexit fatigued we can come to an event on it at this late stage. Um, but it has shown that majority governments in our system cannot actually command the consensus required to provide leadership on modern political issues that don't fall along traditional partisan divides. And I think looking to the future and the kind of politics our young people will inherit, we need to think very carefully about potentially changing our voting system. And again, maybe a controversial point to make, but I would quite like to see in the next 10, 15 years, our country go to a system of proportional representation because that is the only way we're going to ensure that we don't end up in, the, in this kind of mess again. We could have a referendum. <laughs> <laughs> Just to something, sort of what I want to do here, I mean, I'm actually going to cut out some of you. I'd like our under 35s in the audience to go to the phones. I'm sorry for our over 35s. I would like to think about this question, which is, for those of you under the age of 35, if the politicians have been focusing, one of the things that comes out in this is that there's a sense in which there has been an obsession about Brexit which has been linked very much to a political class which is of a certain age. Well, what are the issues that young people would like to speak about other than Brexit? And I wonder whether our younger voters, our younger audience members would like to give us just a sense about, well, what are those issues that matter? Because at some point, this madness will come to an end, whatever it is. And there will be a need. And certainly, I get the sense from both leavers and remainers when I've done public events with young people, is that they feel that this has crowded out a lot of the other issues that they're concerned about, and that they feel very strongly about, that Brexit's dominated for two and a half years to such an extent that we've kind of missed that out. I don't know, Laura, because you're going to leave us shortly. Of those issues, any other issues? Which is the one that you would think is the most pressing that hasn't been looked at whilst we've been thinking about Brexit? Um, Very quickly. I would say youth mental health and climate change would probably be the two that um, really... Would come to you. Really would come to me. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think I would agree with that, particularly um, mental health, and we can see the results have come in. Yes, uh, mental health and climate change, yes, I would thoroughly agree. That's something that we've campaigned in Scottish Parliament in previous years and still continues to this day. Yeah. I mean, I've seen all of those campaigns come up in various ways through our members of Youth Parliament, Scouts, Guides organisations, and other membership organisations. They're all obviously very important, but mental health has consistently come out. We have a Make Your Mark campaign, for those mm. who don't know. Yeah. Last year we had over a million young people vote in our ballot and mental health is something that consistently comes out in that. So are things like gender equality but, and jobs and employment specifically, but mental health has come up pretty consistently over the past five years at least. Um, in Northern Ireland specifically, um, mental health. Um, the place where I live has the highest suicide rates in the UK, um, which I think says something. Um, and then also I think the whole gay marriage and abortion thing in Northern Ireland is obviously poignant, it's not legal. Um, I, for one, am a strong campaigner for um, for choice in Northern Ireland for young people, or for young ladies, sorry, and I think that that um, is something that's close to a lot of people's hearts in Northern Ireland um, and kind of, yeah, is more big than climate change and whatnot at the minute. Jay? Um, yeah, as, as someone who's 28, I hope I can still come in on this young, the, the young people's vote here. Indeed, yes. yeah. Um, I, well, personally, I, you know, I'm scared to death about the housing crisis. I mean, as a young person today, how do you get on the, on the housing ladder? You need a phenomenal amount of money, and where's that going to come from? Lottery. But, uh, <laughs> a lot of these issues are money-based. And, and the one thing I would say is that whatever government is governing post-Brexit needs to think very carefully about how they fill the void of funding we currently get from the European Social Fund and the European Regional Development Fund, which between 2014 and 2020 totals 11.8 billion. 11.8 billion of investment in six operational areas around the UK. That's more than two billion alone going to Wales, which is the poorest part of the UK. You compare that Theresa, to Theresa May's Stronger Towns Fund, which is 1.6 billion for the entire country. There's a massive shortfall there. Where's it gonna come from? 
Okay, because I want to just think, there's one thing that just ties this all together, and we'll move on to another stage, and we'll bring you back in a little bit more thinking, has been this persistent theme that you don't think politicians listen. You don't think they listen to young people, they don't seem to care. If these are issues that are the real issues and in some ways are interesting in young people, how do you get politicians to listen to young people? Yeah, how do you think you can get them to start to respond? To this? Um, I'll come as no surprise that I might list off some Scottish examples here, but there is actually a lot of positive Scottish examples going towards that. In Scotland, for the last three years, we've had a group of young people, members from the Scottish Youth Parliament and other organisations come together, and we've met with the Scottish Government Cabinet every year for the last three years, and that is now uh, an annual commitment. And we believe we're the only country in the world where we have the, the national government cabinet sitting down with young people to discuss exactly these issues. And, and obviously, um, that's not an opportunity that's open to all young people, but young people certainly through our grassroots and the youth parliament have a way of doing that. Um, and I think um, mm. we've seen in Scotland, as we might come on to later on, votes at 16 in Scotland. That has been such a positive example of an engaging young people into we're the We're coming on to that. Don't, don't, we'll don't, don't that lose later. on that one. There is also a Welsh youth parliament, and there has been set up very recently a London youth, youth assembly as well. There is one in Greater Manchester, the Youth Combined Authority. There seems to be a flourishing of these kind of organisations. Esther and then Kira, how do you think you can get politicians to listen? Um, I mean, it is quite hard at the minute with no government, has to be said, <laughs> um, <laughs> in Northern Ireland. Um, how would I get politicians to listen to young people? Um, I think political apathy in Northern Ireland for young people is something that's quite strong. Not a lot of young people... Um, care and I think uh, the politicians think that that goes for everyone in Northern Ireland um, and I think for politicians to actually listen to what we care about I think it would help for them to start coming to campaigns and and Lara um, the our future our choice in Belfast happens all the time um, and I've never seen a politician once um, coming to the event in City Hall um, about our future our choice or the voice for choice um, on abortion and I just think they're there's a lack, there's political apathy within a lot of young people, but also in a lot of politicians at the minute. Because they don't come to where young people are. They yes, they don't. They the young people to come to them. Exactly. And they're not sitting at the minute, um, obviously, in Stormont, which is a problem, uh, which a lot of things aren't happen happening. There was a lot of things that meant to happen this year. A lot of campaigns were meant to go, which didn't, um, because, yeah, there's no one there to lead them. Um, and, yeah, I think it would be probably a good start for politicians to listen to young people in Northern Ireland if they were actually there, um, probably, yeah. Northern Ireland is in a place apart, we really do something about it. Kieran, very quick. Um, well, a number of different levels, really. So if we look at some of the things that members have passed, like we, we as, a, as the National Youth Council of the UK proudly support a people's vote on the, on the, on the terms of the Brexit deal, on our second referendum, how we want to phrase that, that is in our, in our motions booklet. It's a, a policy that we passed at our annual general meeting of all of our members representing 250,000 members of the British Youth Council. So on that level, we want to be heard in terms of what's happening right now. But ultimately, we want to be heard through funded youth councils, so not something that's like an add-on to what a county council wants to do. Oh, you know, we'll have maybe uh, a youth council that can meet every six months or so. No, we want a uh, genuine youth voice in, t in terms of, the, you know, the leader of the council comes to young people and goes, actually, what are your priorities? Instead of, here's a document I've made, just say yes or no. You know, genuine... Um, accessibility of youth councils, funded youth councils, and not just youth councils uh, in, for counties, but also through schools. So genuine platforms, young people can actually have their voices heard, and therefore we might start platforming some more of these issues. And then one of the issues isn't actually up there, it's actually our, our national campaign this year, which was proposed, uh, well, well, for the UK Youth Parliament, which is one of our main members, which is tackling knife crime. So that that is like what young people in our country have voted as one of the most pressing issues through our Make Your Mark ballot. Over a million young people voted on that. And we heard it in the House of Commons, which was voted on uh, by our members of the Youth Parliament who sit in the Commons every November. And it came through as our national campaign because actually it's something that is pressing, that politicians are not uh, focusing on. And when they are focusing on it, is actually to use it to their own agenda and to not listen to young people who are affected by knife crime and actually are in these communities that are disadvantaged, disillusioned, and are facing these issues. And young people can be at the forefront of, this, of these kind of campaigns as long as we platform them, listen to them, and actually value the fact that we have our voices and can be heard as much as any other person in society. It's a, it's a fair point. One of the things that's lost in the debate around this is that 
Austerity has hammered youth council funding across the country because it's linked to local authorities. Ten years ago, I was on a youth citizenship commission and we recommended direct central government funding for all youth councils. Ten years later, it's no closer. It really has cauterized the voice of young people. Lara, before we move on to the next section, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really difficult. We've had this, we've asked consistently, we've, our campaign's existed for a year now, uh, and not a single cabinet minister has met us. Uh, and we, the offer is always open. We, we ask them repeatedly. We don't get an answer. Um, we have actually taken to, we've, we've done three parliament takeovers, where we've got over 200 young people each time to actually come to parliament. And if you come into central lobby, you have the right to demand to see your MP. Uh, and many of them do come down and talk to their MPs, and that's one way. But I think, actually, there's nothing to be ashamed of in working with the politicians who support your causes and trying to get them to be powerful advocates because we know, and we've spoken about this, that the voices of young people aren't respected uh, in, and listened to on the same level uh, as other generations. And when politics is made uh, in Westminster and in Parliament, it's important because there will be MPs often who agree with you to talk, talk to them and work with them. Uh, and they are always willing, uh, I think, to listen uh, and talk to young people if they're, if they're the ones that support your cause. But some of them do. I mean, we, uh, Offok and I, so the Northern Ireland group that we have, um, we went over to meet Michel Barnier like a week and a half ago, and he had an hour-long meeting with us just before he met uh, with Cox and Barclay. Uh, and he said, you know, if you don't deal with politics, it's, it will deal with you. Uh, and it's very, very important to just be tenacious. And I really think that. I think if you're a young person and you feel disaffected at the moment, uh, you can still have your voices heard. And it's fine to be a bit unconventional. It's fine to uh, do stunts and interventions in a way you've got license to do that and in a way you're slightly allowed to do that. And it does make it maybe more fun uh, and engaging. Mm. But yeah, politics affects you in so many various ways. And it's so important, I think, for us to engage young people. And of course, what, I mean, I guess you guys are about to talk about votes at 16. But my old lecturer at university, um, a guy called David Runciman, recently was in the headlines because he said that we should extend the voting age to six, uh, which I think even he doesn't really think is serious, but used it to highlight the point that uh, young people are among the most discriminated against in representative democracy. We're not considered a powerful enough voting bloc uh, to sway the policies of uh, politicians when they are seeking re-elections, and that's something which needs to be radically readdressed. And I think to engage young people, you have to invest them, uh, and you have to let them know that um, you know politics, politics can make a change in their life and can be part of a positive change, and I think that's something which is really important. Laura, James, thank you very much. I'd like to... And the last section is, is in many ways linked to an issue which comes up over and over again, which is this question about lowering the voting age. The idea that one of the things that Brexit uh, may be revealed is, is, is that the case for lowering the voting age is either strengthened or weakened. There was a debate when the referendum was being set up in 2016 uh, about having 16 and 17 year olds being allowed to vote in it. It was based on the experience of the Scottish referendum of 2014. Parliament chose to deny the lowering of the voting age 16 and 17. And many of the arguments that were based there are traditional arguments which have defined debates about vote lowering the voting age. Before we start with the panel, I'd just like to get a sense of, uh, of, uh, of how the audience feels about this issue. Um, there are different ways in which we can think about voting aid, because it's not simply that it is an either-or question. Should the voting age stay at the age of 18 for all elections? Uh, Northern Ireland should be on that as well, by the way. Um, should it be lowered for 16 for only local and city regional mayoral elections, as in the same as it would be in Scotland and will be in Wales, because Scotland and Wales do not yet vote at Westminster, or should the voting age be lowered for all elections to 16? And it, interesting just to get your, is that going to work? Yes. Views on that. And while we're talking about that, Shakira, you may want to talk about the National Union of Students. They've had a very vigorous campaign around lowering the voting age. What are the reasons that you think the voting age should be lowered to 16? I mean, some people might not like what I'm about to say, but if you can sleep with your MP, <laughs> you can sleep with them, but you can't vote for them. You get your national insurance number at three months before your 16th birthday. You can join the army, but you can't have any choice of whether you want to what, what that means for you. So I think, actually, what should happen is the young members of parliament should take over parliament because it seems like they're doing a better job in talking about these issues than our actual, you know, our actual government. And this might be controversial, and I always kind of piss off the older generation 
um, oh. as I've done at question time, I think you're bad luck for me with that. I am. <laughs> um, but I definitely think there needs to be, I don't know what it looks like, but I just don't think that, you know, you should be allowed to, not be allowed, but there should be limits on how long you can stay in these positions for because we need change and we need people to be able to see things differently and when we look at our members of parliament and we look at parliament and we see the average age it's a lot of older people. Do you think lowering the vote age would change the composition of We parliament? definitely need to change the composition and make it more modern more more representative you know when I see for example there's how many young women there are when there's people in parliament voting until 10 o'clock at night and they're their mothers and carers and stuff like that. It's not representative. I just bring in Jack, because Jack has got experience of that. Because obviously in Scotland, there has been a uh, learned vote age of 16 since 2014. There's been now two cycles of elections where six and seven year olds have voted outside of the referendum. Would you say that it's changed Scottish politics? Is there any discernible change in its impact? Yeah, absolutely. I've already alighted to uh, the positive impact that I believe the 2014 Scottish ref referendum had, and that was a real trailblazer within the UK for votes at 16. Um, and then obviously 2014 and then 2016, votes at 16 for the Scottish and local elections. So I found myself in the situation where I had voted for my local councillor I had in, in uh, May uh, 2016, then went on to vote for my local member for the Scottish Parliament uh, in May 2016. And then in June 2016, that civil right that I had exercised twice was then taken away from me. And it's a constitutional injustice that a 16-year-old in Dumfries, which is in the south of Scotland, has a civil right. But a 16-year-old at just 30 miles down the road in Carlisle doesn't have that civil right. So I think this is a really... Uh, fundamentally human rights-based issue. And how can we live in a United Kingdom where different parts of the United Kingdom, you, have, you hold different civil rights? And what greater civil right than voting? Voting should not be determined by what accent you have. It should be united. And I should also say in terms of uh, youth engagement, definitely votes at 16, I think, is a very positive example of how we can get young people engaged in, in our politics. But I'll, and hand in hand with that, we have got to invest in our youth services. And I would urge you to read a groundbreaking uh, report last year um, by friends of mine in Orkney on, on how local councils, because all, you know, your, your bins, your, your health services locally, these are really important issues to you on a day-to-day -day basis. How can you get young people as part of that policy making about their futures? And that is how you build a better future, is if you involve young people in the policy making and the decision making from an early age, if you involve them in terms of the decisions that are being made for the future that they will then inherit, you are gonna get far more respectful, engaged communities. To give you a counter argument on that, it's a very good point, is that the UK is not the only country where there is different tiered voting. Norway, Germany has also got that similar. So it's not atypical of that. Um, yeah. Vote at 16. Um, I, I mean, I'm probably going to be the, uh, the, the one with the difference of opinion here. I, I mean, know, 20% of you are behind you. Very true, very true. Maybe not then. I mean, uh, the thing for me with votes at 16 is it's not that I, I don't want young people involved in politics because uh, I want young people involved at every stage of, uh, of politics in uh, talking about, you know, um, in policy forums, getting involved in campaigning. But the one thing to me is, last year I stood as a local councillor in my local area uh, at 18. Now, if I was asked to do that two years before at 16, uh, I would tell you that I probably wouldn't have uh, as much clue or the, the skills uh, to have done that then. And I mean,